that song, apparently there's a microwave machine out in the back and they just put it exactly as quiet, so don't worry about that. Now. More news series. It's, it's that's fun. the brainwashing frequency. It, it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, that's it. Right, what I want to do is uh, basically, thanks for all coming back on time. <coughs> and no, we've got, a busy, we've got a busy day, there's quite a few there. If this might, let us know if it's intimate and let us know, guys. Um, got next up is Ben, our Ben, and um, so we do it. Ben it was a hospital court, he's been through quite a lot in the last year. Um, we were talking, I mean, it was a good year ago now, Ben, and uh, said, you know, good things are going to happen from his situation, which I'm always going to go into. To, for him to be standing here now doing talks and what happened to him, through basically trying to put the information out that we we're all subjected to and, and spread the word, that ultimately was part of the the main reason why he lost he, he lost his job as a, as a hospital board. Yeah. So Ben now is with a few of the subjects that Ben's going to be enlightening us. It's a great privilege to have him here. He's been about as part of my awakening uh, as I know as many others. So guys, we got together for our Ben. Thank you. For his pride and dignity, start the new world order. Yes. Um, is anyone actually is anyone in this room a hospital porter by any chance? No. Uh, is anyone an ex hospital porter? No. Nobody. Sorry, wrong conference. It's the one down the road. <laughs> I know one that's dead. Oh, that, that's near enough. Near enough. <laughs> Now, um, my daughter actually says I sound like David Icke, and I talk like David Icke. Um, I actually do not talk like David Icke, okay? If you think I do, then it's just a coincidence, nothing to worry about. <laughs> right, um, you'll notice that when I asked if anyone was a hospital porter, uh, I didn't put my own hand up. I put my own hand up when I said, is anyone an ex-hospital porter? And that's because, as Paul said, I was a hospital porter, I'm not anymore. I was a hospital for porter for 23 years, and um, my service was unblemished, and even no false modesty here, it was exemplary. And then, out of the blue one day, I was suspended and discharged from the NHS. Now, um, this afternoon you're going to hear Tony Farrell. Um, he, as many of you already know, was also suspended and discharged from the police force. Um, basically, I've had to face a similar situation with, uh, with one crucial difference, and that is with Tony, he was turned up to work on a night shift one day, got called into the boss's office, Ben, we're suspending you. I had to hand over my ID, my equipment belt, everything, and I asked why, and she says, I can't tell you. The following morning, I phoned up my shop steward and I said, I was suspended last night. He said, why? I said, I don't know. He said, what do you mean you don't know? Didn't they tell you? And I said, no. In fact, it was a week later when I found out the reason they gave me that I had been suspended. They said that somebody had complained about what I was doing on the Panmo. That's my blog, my YouTube channel, the radio show and everything else. And I was dumbfounded because I've been doing the panel for five years and I made no secrets about it either. Everyone at work, everyone at the hospital knew what I did. I spoke to them about it. Sometimes, sometimes I was laughed at, sometimes I was called nuts. Some, some people were encouraging. But everybody knew it, including the readers and viewers I had in senior managerial grades. And somebody suddenly complains and they have to investigate. Well, to cut a long story short, I went through a disciplinary procedure and was dismissed. It is a long story, I don't have time to tell it all today, but um, it's, there's so many suspicious elements to, to what happened to me. I mean, they, did, they never said, as they did with Tony, we're suspending you because of your views about these subjects, and we're sacking you because of it. You see, Firstly, you don't just suspend someone out of the blue. You try to, you know, if you're an employer and you have a member of staff, you only suspend them when you have to if they've committed the most serious offence. Suspending someone, it's very, very hard work. It generates a lot of paperwork, it costs a lot of money. I think they suspended me and they sat me because they panicked. Because somebody high up in the Department of Health phoned them up and told them to get rid of me. 
Can't prove it, but no evidence at all. It's the only thing that fits. I spoke to an industrial solicitor, and I said, I want to, I want to sue my former employees for fraud. It's not unfair dismissal, it's fraud. They said, I can't take your case, sorry. And I said, well, don't you think it's weird? And, he's, and this guy said, yes. If you ask me to comment informally, I would say what happened to you was extremely suspicious. In fact, in 20 years of practicing industrial law, it's the most unusual case I've ever come across. But I can't take your case. What is the crucial factor here? It's, it's not just a breach of normal procedure and normal practice in terms of my suspension. It's the fact that less than two weeks before I was suspended, I was interviewed by several national newspapers and they published articles about me. Now, could that be a coincidence? Well, you can never, you can never disprove it. When someone cries coincidence, you can never disprove it. That's the problem. Now, how do I get into this business? How do I wake up, as the saying goes? Well, there's no one moment when it happened. It's a process that took a number of years. I became conspiratorially aware. And I became aware of the kind of things that we've spoke, we speak about here. One of the major turning points was, of course, 9 11, as it was for, I think, many people. Another was in 2005. In 2005, my 10 year old daughter came home from school and said, Dad, the teachers at my school want to take my fingerprints. They're taking all our fingerprints. And I said, What? 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 Um, and she said, um, Yeah. So I phoned up, this, I phoned up the school. And the headmistress, I finally got through to the headmistress on quite a lot of effort. And she says, I don't know anything about this. It turns out um, there, was an, there was an announcement in the school newsletter, which I didn't read very properly to my discredit, but uh, it was on page four, a little box at the bottom. It was an announcement that the school said, we will be taking the fingerprints of all pupils in order to create a library electronic database. Not do you mind if we do, we are going to. They didn't even ask our permission. If, if when my daughter was at school, if she, um, if, the, if the school teachers wanted to take her for a trip to the park, they used to send a permission slip, which I had to fill in. Yet they were going to take her fingerprints without so much as a buy your leave. I phoned, I phoned back, trying to get hold of the headmistress. She wouldn't answer my calls. Eventually, the librarian gave me a call at school. It's all right, Mr. Evelyn Jones. This system doesn't take the whole fingerprint of the child. It just takes one little segment. And I promise you, the database will only be used for the library for nothing else. And I said, well, several problems with that is it doesn't really matter what you say you're going to use the database for. You can easily change your mind at any time. When it comes to Big Brother, we have to deal with capabilities, not professed intents. And the second problem, and I think the biggest, is the cultural and psychological aspects of this. It's programming the youngest members of our society to accept Big Brother surveillance and biometric ID as normal. We, if they brought it in today, we, adults, will remember a time when these things weren't around. We'll realise that it's new. Like Winston Smith in 1984, because he was a sort of like middle-aged adult, he remembered his childhood before Big Brother took power. The nursery rhymes he used to sing, things like that. It was the children, he said, he had to really fear, because they were the ones who'd been born into the Big Brother state. They'd grown up in it, and they didn't know anything else. Anyway, the, the, the headmistress still refused to take my calls, so I wrote a letter saying, Dear Miss, um, you must not take any biometric data from my daughter at all. If any of my staff member tries to, I'm instructed to refuse and refer that staff member to me. And um, she, she went through her school career without being fingerprinted, but other kids were. I tried, I went up to the parents of those children, I tried to talk them out of it when I was picking up my kids from school. Some of them listened to me, others didn't. 
right, so, so you know, what's, what's going on? How do my life experiences fit into the bigger picture? That's the question. Now, I'm going to talk to you about a few things today which, if you're not familiar with this information, you might find a bit strange. Now, Rob B just now was telling us how he believes in solutions and he doesn't get involved in esoteric matters. And that's fair enough, and I, I quite agree, we do need solutions. And what's more, the work that Rob is doing in terms of the politics, the legal matters, the philosophy, is absolutely rightly important. And I'm equally active in these areas as well. But at the same time, the esoteric is a part of our life, it is a part of this world. And um, whether we like it or not, we have to face up to it. And I think the esoteric is related to what Rob has said, and what the speakers this afternoon will say, and what a lot of the rest of you here have ideas about. It's, it's, I'll explain how it's related. I'll explain that what I'm about to tell you is not intended to be an alternative to the, uh, what the other speakers are going to say today. It's not intended, it's not something instead of what they say. What I say is something that I intend to be complementary. Now, uh, when you look up into the sky, you see certain things. You see birds, clouds, the sun. At night time, you see stars, the moon, and other astronomical objects. And since they were invented in the last century or so, you see aircraft, man-made objects in the sky. Sometimes, you will see things in the sky and you won't recognise them. And those things, because you can't identify them, are by definition unidentified flying objects. UFOs. Now, what are they? Now, if you can't identify them, logically, that's a very, very difficult question to answer. <coughs> but one thing is for certain, though, the majority of UFOs you see will be birds, kites, aircraft, astronomical bodies, and other normal things. Euphora, which is the country's biggest UFO search organisation, says that 95% plus of recorded UFO sightings are simply normal things that people have failed to recognise because they're at the wrong angle, they're too far away, too high up, whatever. Other research organisations say that that figure is about 70%. And I've got a book that was written in the 1980s that puts that figure at, 53, at um, 63%. Why there is this discrepancy, I don't know. Now, um, before we go any further, I think I need to clear up a few myths about UFOs. Number one, they are all birds, and Chinese lanterns, and aircraft, and kites, and heavenly bodies, and uh, lighthouses, weather balloons, lorry loads of burning manure, driven by parachute test dummies, of course, or joyriding ice cream vans. My absolute favourite, I think, is the, the lorry of manure. I mean, what a pile of manure that is. Myth number two. Nobody saw UFOs before the 1940s. The theory is that it was in that decade that alien and sci-fi movies in the cinema became popular, and so people started seeing these things in the sky because they'd seen them in the movies. This culminated in the pivotal year of 1947 when there was a sighting by Kenneth Arnold, which coined the term flying saucer, and the Roswell incident, which I'll come on to more in a second. Rubbish. People have been reporting UFOs for as long as written records exist. The oldest actually reported UFO sighting that I can think of is probably the visions related by the narrator of the book of Ezekiel in the Bible. There are 15th century paintings of UFOs, and there are even cave paintings of UFOs. <coughs> and what's what, these, these images look exactly like the classic disc of popular, our popular image. Same goes for the aliens. I'll come to that in a minute. Yeah. All right, I'm not Neil Haig. <laughs> like that. Now in the modern era, People have been reporting UFO sightings for as long as they've been able to do so without being burned at the stone as witches. The first no 
known UFO photograph dates from 1870, which is not long after the invention of the camera, and it distinctly shows a, a cigar-shaped object silhouetted against cloud scene, a massive cloud scale. With the invention of small portable cameras, which were cheap enough to buy by most people, the photographs of UFOs became common. And there were photographs dating from the 1920s and the 1930s of objects like this, which are freely available. That was long before sci-fi movies became popular. In 1898, <clears throat> I read there's a newspaper article you can read quite freely, which describes how the people of Texas and many other parts of the southern United States experienced sightings of mysterious airships. And when you read this article, you have to understand that um, the terms like flying saucers and UFOs didn't exist then. But, if you actually listen to the, the language, and this is the language used, they're talking about a UFO flap. This culminated in a, the crashing of an object at a place called Aurora in Texas. And it's um, a very, very mysterious case. Not very well reported, but um, very strange indeed. Aliens too. Throughout history, people have recorded encounters with strange beings that there's various different types, but they're not human. And even iconic ones, like the iconic ones you see in fiction in, in films like Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you see them, as I say, dating back descriptions from various texts that date back a long, long way, including from India, China, and other places. And again, even cave paintings. Beings like this. I'll try and draw one. Abel the alien. <laughs> Oh, myth number three. If they're not trucks of manure flying through the sky, so accompanied by lighthouses levitating, then they are, and they are absolutely certainly aliens from other planets. Definitely aliens from some other planet. This is called the classic extraterrestrial hypothesis. It means that what it says is that these craft are basically nuts and bolts machines which are spacecraft similar to our own, like our space shuttle, but far more sophisticated. And they fly by these creatures, which are basically flesh and blood beings that have evolved in physical form like we have. And they come from some planet, like maybe Mars, or somewhere outside the solar system. A planet which we would be able to see if only we had a good enough telescope. That is the classic extraterrestrial hypothesis. But there's very little def direct evidence to say that this is the case. At least not in all cases, certainly. UFOs <clears throat> may actually be a very different animal to that. In fact, they may be a wide variety of phenomena, including classic extraterrestrials. But I think that most of them are something else. I think they might be related to ghosts. Now, in terms of ghosts, what are ghosts? They're kind of collective generic name for a whole series of phenomena, I think. And I think there is some overlap with the UFOs. There are myths about ghosts as there are myths about UFOs. For instance, that ghosts, the most likely place you can see a ghost is at a graveyard. It's usually some cow figure with a white thing clanking, clanking chains and stuff like that. That's not true. You're as likely to see a ghost in a graveyard as anywhere else. Another thing, that ghosts only appear at night. In fact, ghosts are almost likely to appear in daylight as they are at night. It's a myth. Um, the ghosts tend to appear actually where there's been a lot of suffering, a lot of pain, a lot of death. Murder scenes are often haunted, battlefields. And the absolute number one spot is hospitals. And I'll come on to that, because um, that's very, very important. Um, I actually was on night shift one night. I, I was serving in the AA department. I came, in to, came to work, came on duty. I was told that a few hours before I was on duty, how I wish it had happened when I was there, one of the nurses <coughs> came running out of the emergency assessment unit. Now, just to explain, the emergency assessment unit is a side ward of A&E. It's called a different name, so the government can put people in there and say they're beating the waiting lists. The waiting time, sorry. But it's basically part of A&E. Anyway, the nurse came running out of there screaming, and I, I, I deduced that she had actually seen a spectral apparition on that ward. No reports made, <coughs> no incident reports filled in, people just went back to work. And it's surprising, actually, how often this happens when these things occur. Things we don't expect. Things that don't fit into our accepted view of what is possible and impossible. 
And I had another interesting experience myself. I, I see I've had these experiences myself. I've witnessed a little boy kneeling on the floor of my bedroom. Something very, very strange happened actually when I was um, on my way back from visiting my girlfriend once. I live in Oxford, my girlfriend lives in Nottingham. Just a couple of a few weeks after we first started dating, I was on the train home one night to Oxford. And um, I was laying in a, it was, it was a dark outside around this time of year. And of course, if you're on a train and it's dark, the windows become like kind of mirrors. And they reflected the interior of the cabin very accurately as a mirror, like one of these mirrors almost. And I was sort of leaning back in my seat, and I was in, in that half asleep state where my eyes were open, but I wasn't really awake. And I was staring at the window like that, and I suddenly realised someone was standing in the aisle of the train looking at me. Standing completely still. I could see him straight ahead as a reflection, but I could see the actual person in the corner of my eye standing in the aisle on the left side of the cabin. And I felt this individual just standing there. I watched him as he watched me. I didn't feel threatened. I didn't feel any particular world from this individual. I felt I was under intense scrutiny. Um, <clears throat> this apparition was a humanoid. It, was, it looked like a human. In fact, it looked like a, a middle-aged man with thin, dark hair. And he was wearing a white jacket, like a bar steward's jacket. After a while, I saw him like that. Like that and I kind of jerked out of my my state of consciousness and came completely awake. I didn't think much more of it, but when I went back to see my girlfriend, next time I went to visit her, I told her about the experience. She gasped. She went upstairs and she got her photo album and brought it down. She showed me a black and white photo of a man with thin hair and a white bar steward jacket standing behind the bar of a pub. And she said, is that the man you saw? And I said, well, it looks a bit like him. I can't be 100% certain, but it looks a bit like him. She said, that's my dad, and he died in 1980. One of the myths of ghosts is that they're all dead people. And I don't think they all are, but some of them are. And um, if that was indeed my girlfriend's father, I can form a theory about why he was keeping an eye on me. He was doing the same thing that living fathers do with their daughters. He's interested in what kind of blokes are hanging around with her. As I said, you know, you can see the ghosts of living people too. You can even see your own ghost. It's called a doppelganger. That's a German word, which means you're walking double. Now, if you see one of those, it's supposed to be bad luck or something. But don't, if you do, if you do see it, don't panic, all right? That's, that's not certified. Now, um, <clears throat> I'm going to discuss. I'm not a paranormal investigator by profession, I should say. I don't even do it seriously as a hobby. I'm going to talk about something that very few paranormal investigators do, and that is the politics of the paranormal, how it fits in to the rest of human society. And I'm not just talking about ghosts, I'm not just talking about UFOs, I'm talking about things like cryptozoology as well. This is the study of unknown animals, like Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot. For some reason, which I'm not 100% certain about, Governments badly need us to think that these things don't exist. And I'll tell you, they spend an awful lot of energy and effort in trying to maintain this illusion. Persuading us these things just don't exist. And they use a variety of methods, which I'm going to explain. Firstly, the media. What's a typical UFO story? A typical UFO story is they report, the news readers usually have smirking faces, and they say people have seen strange things in the sky over somewhere. Then they have a reporter live on the scene and the X-Files theme is playing in the background. <laughs> and then he's halfway through his report, his report, <clears throat> and suddenly somebody else above the frame of, of the TV screen will dangle a model, a model flying saucer on a screen. Just one of these, just dangle them in front of him and he sort of goes, <laughs> either that or a marionette of an alien, like that. And everyone in the studio will have a good laugh. Occasionally they'll bring on some experts. They'll bring on an expert. Guess what planet that one comes from? That's actually Nick Pope. <laughs> the guy that they often bring on Nick Pope, he's the most common. Now, um, Nick Pope is a man I know personally, and um, we sometimes talk, and we get on well together, I quite like the guy. 
got nothing against the person. And I don't think he's deliberately lying. Now, he actually admits that some UFOs are ET. But one thing he vehemently denies is the government is hiding anything about it. He's totally opposed to that. And he said, I should know I work for the government. And that's true, he did. He, he is someone in ufology who definitely was a government agent once. He was, uh, he ran the, <coughs> the government's UFO desk, Secretariat AS2. Personally, if I had a saucer in a hangar, to quote his favourite phrase, Nick Pope, the public face of British ufology, would be the last man on earth, I would tell. Another of these people is a guy called Dr. David Clark, and he's, he's sort of taken over the role from Nick Pope in a way. He's become more popular in recent years. He goes one stage further than Nick. Clark says there are no UFOs apart from folklore. People, you know, the same things are what's folklore. And um, basically, he's, he's written an article, there's been several articles that are coming out at the moment, basically saying it's all under for UFOs. It's a closed case, they don't exist. Clark is the author of one of these articles. And the, the article was entitled, I should point out, he didn't choose the title, but he, he could have done, Closed Encounters of the Third Kind. I could have guessed that was in the sun. Now, I don't think, I don't think Clark is a deliberate liar either. No, I don't. A lot, a lot of people disagree with me. I don't think he's lying. I think the people who have the secrets about UFOs are very senior military and intelligence and government officials. I mean, it would be a massive liability to have someone on TV all the time with all that information. I mean, what if they decided to spill the beans? Supposing Nick Pope or Dave Clark were on Richard and Judy, and they said, wait, wait, it's all nonsense, I've been lying to you. UFOs are real. And the director couldn't cut that quickly. It would go out to everyone. No, no. The people who, the real secrets, are never allowed any contact with the media. The manipulators of the media don't recruit people to lie for them. They simply make sure people with the right views, the convenient views, are given all the publicity. When there's a news report about UFOs next, ask yourself, you'll, you'll see even Nick Pope or Dave Clark on it. I absolutely almost guarantee it, with a few notable exceptions, you never see anyone else. Why is Scott Felton never told on TV? Why is Richard D. Hall never on TV? Why not Timothy Good? Why not me? Apart from the fact I'm probably too scruffy. The secret is that UFOs are objects from another world. They are artifacts of an extraterrestrial civilization. By extraterrestrial, I don't necessarily mean from another planet. They may well come from other worlds, other dimensions, beyond the one we can see. That's a big subject, but what we see around us is not all that exists. The same applies to ghosts, as I'll explain in a minute. Sometimes these objects come to grief on the Earth's surface. When this happens, they are often secretly salvaged by the government, including the beings that are fighting them. This kind of thing is called a Roswell. And it's only a matter of time before it is entered into the Oxford English Dictionary under that definition. It's named after the Roswell incident, which took place in July of 1947, which is the first, it wasn't actually the first of these cases, but it was the first one that became famous, and is still the most famous. For some reason, it is vitally important to the New World Order that we humans believe that our planet is an oasis of life in an infinite, sterile cosmic desert. They sweat buckets and they jump through hoop after hoop after hoop to maintain this illusion. Why? Why was that? Why is that? There may there are several reasons. One is well, we have to go back to the beginning of the American space program to get some details on this. A report was released by the Brookings Institute, which is rather like the Tavistock Institute, a similar kind of thing, designed to mess with your heads. And it was a report written for NASA. And in this report it said, if in the course of the space program NASA was to discover an extraterrestrial intelligence or records of, and remains of an extraterrestrial intelligence of the past, 
It would be a good idea not to shout it from the rooftops. They were worried about the effects that such revelation have on our culture, on our psychology, on our mass psychology, institutions like the church, the state, corporations, na na nations, how they survive. So there we have, we have a report from a very, very highly respected think tank recommending a cover-up. It's not ordering it, it's recommending it. And does the government ever obey the instructions of these think tanks? Yes, they do. There's another reason, this is to do with free energy. <clears throat> now the means, the, means to the means exist, and it is possible to create energy out of the very fabric of space. Energy is simple, it's safe, it's clean, and the supply is infinite. And what's more, it's cost free. Free energy is even present in nature. It's been observed in weather phenomena like tornadoes. And some animals have evolved to use it, such as some species of fish. Now, free energy, if it was in use, would transfer form this world in an unimaginable way. I mean, you should think for a moment about the changes that would happen if we had free energy. It would solve nearly all the world's problems. It would eliminate poverty, starvation in the third world, environmental destruction. So why don't we have it? Makes good sense to me. There's, the reasons are split, I think, because on a lower level, there are people keeping the, keeping the secret who are basically money orientated there. It's for economic reasons, they are selfish people, and that, this is what motivates them to keep it quiet. Oil companies. Oil is the fuel and the lubricant of civilization at the moment, under the current order. It's more than just a business. It is business. And our industrial interests dread the changes that it would bring. It would bring a revolution which would see India, China, with their huge populations and massive resources dominating the world. Something which incidentally I think is going to happen anyway, but that's another story. JP Morgan put it very, very well. Well, I don't know if this is an actual quote, but he said to have told Tesla, I can't use this because I can't put a meter on it. And you can't put, you can't put a meter on free energy. The people, the free energy sceptics always say, well, why not just sell the energy? If, if, it was, if it were real, people would be trying to sell it. No, no, you can't. It's like, it's ridiculous. It's like putting a, a, an anemometer, a wind, a wind measuring device, on a sailing ship attached to a meter and charging the skipper for the use of the wind. That's how that's, it's, you can't sell it. All you can do is you use it, and let everyone use it, or cover it up and don't let anyone use it. I think in a higher word, there's more. It's not just about money. In a word, it's about control. Free energy is not just called free because it costs nothing. It's called free because it will set, it will set us free. Free from the dependency on fossil fuels. And it goes back a long way. <clears throat> I just mentioned Nikola Tesla. It, goes, it can be traced back, this cover-up can actually be traced back way to the 19th century before oil was even in common use. And coal was the bedrock of the fuel economy. So why is free energy related to UFOs? I will explain that it goes back before the modern UFO era by a long way. The reason is because UFOs don't traverse space and, and come through dimensional wormholes using Texaco 4-star. They have a power system which is free energy and they have anti-gravity propulsion. Now, at these Roswell events I've explained about, the government has actually salvaged these craft. And what they, what's more, they have managed to work out how this system works and they've built working replicas. That is a story coming out from high-level whistleblowers at the moment. This is the realm of exopolitics, the realm of the disclosure movement. <clears throat> and I'm a big fan of that. I go, I go to the exopolitics conferences, and I, I do admire the people who do it, but I differ from many of the people involved because I don't think willing disclosure is possible. 
I don't think it matters how many times you write to your MP. I don't think it matters if you camp outside the White House. You're not going to have willing disclosure. I mean, the reasons this, well, one of the reasons, is are you seriously going to sit down for your dinner and see David Cameron, or if you're in America, Barack Obama, or some other head of government, saying, you know, UFOs are real. We discovered that 80 years ago. And what's more, we back engineered their propulsion and power systems to free energy, you know. Um, we forgot to tell you. Sorry. Do you think that's going to happen? No, because you know, while they were listening to that speech, every single person sitting in front of their television would be listening in their heads all of the world's history for almost a century and thinking how different it would be if this had been declassified. You know, they, it's, it's the worst kind of confession imaginable. It's worse than confessing a murder. It's worse, it's, it's effectively confessing to ecocide and the murder of a billion people. Because all the environmental destruction, all the wars for oil, all starvation, all the poverty, it's all been for nothing. It was all preventable. No, um, <clears throat> disclosure what will, will become when we, through humanity, break into an empty Area 51 and basically knock down the door of the cellar. The problem is, you know, when I talked about Cameron, you know, or Obama making a speech like that, I mean, we, we also, on top of, top of all that, you know, it's the problems I spoke about earlier, the Brookings Institute, and the problems associated from their point of view with free energy. Now, why is there a ghost cover-up, do you think? Surely ghosts doesn't really matter. How does it, how does it matter in terms of the politics of this country, this world, if ghosts are real or not? Now that's a more difficult question to answer than the UFO issue, and I'm not entirely sure of it. It could be connected to the Brookings Institute idea, that in terms that they don't want to know, the, the government don't want us to know there's life out there on planets. They also don't want us to know there's life in other dimensions. And I, I suspect that a lot of ghosts are actually bleed overs there. It's when, when the dimension, you know, because universe, universes, there are many universes in hyperspace, and sometimes they blend, they, they could bleed over, and you actually see briefly into another universe. That's what I think a lot of ghosts are. But it's impossible to address the issue of ghosts without addressing the issue of the reality of life after death. Now see, it seems that governments want us, governments have an aversion to that. They have an aversion to the concept of the afterlife. They want us to believe one or two things. Firstly, they want us to believe the religious model. <clears throat> and that is, we have a soul, it belongs to God. God created it, God will take it back and either send us to heaven or hell, depending on how good we've been or whether we put any coins in the in the pot of church, or whether we turn a blind eye when the priest is raping the children. Yeah, you, you go to heaven if you do that, apparently. Personally, if that was me, I'd rather go to hell. I think I deserve it. Another one is the science model, and that's science in quotes. The science model says that you're an animated piece of meat. You didn't exist before your birth. All your thoughts, feelings, emotions are created by the brain. Your sense of consciousness is a product of the brain. All through your life, you're a helpless plaything of random chance. And at the end of your life, your brain stops working, you'll cease to exist forever. That's the science model. Now, religion, those two models are portrayed in the media as opposites, as enemies fighting each other, two opposites. You have to pick one side or the other. You'll get Richard Dawkins debating with some priest, and he'll go, I think that God is a delusion. There is no evidence of the God hypothesis at all. It's all primitive superstition. On the other side, you get some priest or something like, you know, Richard, you may not believe in him, but there's a man called Jesus Christ, and he loves you, and I will pray for your soul. These are the two choices we're given. You don't, there's no third option in conventional wisdom in conventional society. Anyone who suggests the first option, it's very interesting to see what happens because both religion 
and establishment of science will stand side by side and unite in condemnation of these people. They'll join forces and attack us, you and me, if you have these ideas. So the good news, is what I'm talking about, is that we are neither mindless products of a chemical accident, nor are we servants of a man with a beard sitting in heaven. We are actually infinite internal aspects of the universal consciousness. We're infinitely wise, we're infinitely aware, we're infinitely powerful, and we're infinitely knowledgeable. That is the biggest secret. Not UFOs, not ghosts, not free energy, that. So I say we should be spiritual. I wonder, you know, I was walking along the road the other day, we were touching trees just last night. Now, some people will say, well, oh, that means you want to detach from reality. You want to become, a new, you want to go into some sort of new age deal and forget about everything else and forget about the world. No, no. Real spirituality inspires you to take action in the real world. It makes you more grounded, not more detached. If, you, if you're feeling like you're moving away from the real world, then you're on the wrong track. And I hope, I hope, I, I do hope to give hope. I want to give hope to the people who, because some people are losing heart. Some people are saying this ain't going to work and we're not going to win. Because I think we, we're in with a chance. There's never guarantees, but we are. I mean, it's, when we arrived on uh, yesterday, we got into a taxi, and um, it was amazing. All the taxis in Manchester we had to jump into. We picked Manchester's very own Jerry Fletcher. This guy was really clued in. Uh, we gave him some cars for the conference and for the station. We, we gave him about a dozen cars, actually. He's going to hand them out to all his friends. I hope he'd be here today. He might be somewhere. I did say, you're going to come and you're working tomorrow. Don't, if you're not, come along to our conference. And this, in a sense, it was quite an experience because we'd just been sitting around in a pub, you know, watching people, watching TV and thinking, well, these people aren't on our side. They're not aware of what's going on in this world. And we're thinking, we start thinking, what's the point? And then we get in this taxi and there's this guy there. So don't underestimate what people are capable of, especially when you take the fact of the account that we are all knowledgeable and all powerful, if only we remember. As David Icke said at his recent event at Wembley Arena, remember who you are. Now, the name of this station is not Critical Mass Radio for nothing. Uh, critical Mass is a, is, a very, is a very important phrase. It refers to a point where some uh, mass is reached. When something it triggers a reaction. This is used in physics to create a nuclear reaction, but it refers to population too, it refers to psychology and our collective unconscious. Now, there was a brilliant scientist called Lyle Watson, a South African guy, died a few years ago. In the early 1970s, he wrote some great books. Unfortunately, they're out of print, but there's a lot of second-hand copies floating around if you want one. Um, one of the things he talked about was what he called the 100th monkey effect. He was studying monkeys on a group of islands off the coast of Australia. And he found that these monkeys used to eat potatoes. And one day, one of the monkeys discovered that if you put the potatoes in seawater, wash them in the sea, they taste better. So other monkeys watched him doing it, and they, and they, they copied him. They copied him from, in that way. And this is the equivalent of us going and handing a leaflet to somebody and saying, read that, and they read it and they get it. But then suddenly, after a certain number of the population knew about all these things, there was a sudden explosion of this knowledge among all the population, the even the monkeys on other islands, who had not had direct access to the original monkeys who discovered this trick. It was as if some, some point was reached in a collective unconscious, as, as Carl Jung called it, He's a psychologist, but he's quite into sort of spiritual matters too. 
A certain point was reached, and suddenly, click, it all. We got it all in one go. Now, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be ironic, wouldn't it be terrible, if we gave up the moment before we hit that hundred monkey? I think the Illuminati was laughing at us for centuries. Just don't give up, keep going. Keep trying everything you do, keep at it, whatever it might be, whatever your subject interests are, whether it's the law, whether it's politics, whether it's UFOs, anything. Keep going, keep plugging away. Because when you hit that monkey monkey point, suddenly, it's in a very much short space of time, you will see results, big results. And there's bad news associated with that, because we can't play victim. All right, Alex Jones does this a lot. He talks about, it's your mum and all, it's school. They're attacking us. Both the fence us humans. Well, maybe on one level that's true, but why are they here? Why are they attacking us? The answer is, and this is a sad, this is a difficult truth to face, but it means we've given them, it's because we've given them fertile ground to grow. All cultures across the earth have a legend of what they call the fall of man. This is symbolized by the Garden of Eden and many other stories where we lived in an aware state, and somehow we got something went wrong, badly wrong, and we fell to a low state. This is the story of Atlantis, the story of Kanto of Gwailod, the story of Manu in India. All these cultures have it. So it's, it's rather like the parable of the sower, um, which Je where Jesus talks about the word of God falling on the fallow ground and then falling on the stones and not, or among the brambles and not growing. It's kind of an alternative version for that. The solution to this problem is we have to become the stony ground and no longer be fertile for these people. And it's, it's very, very simple, really. It starts, as Michael Jackson said, with a man in the mirror. You look at yourself and what you do in your own life, as I've had to. There's a remote chance that I could have kept my job if I had taken, got rid of the panel or changed it into something completely unrecognisable to what it is. There's an outside chance. I don't think it would have worked because I think I was, they were told to get rid of me and they would have got rid of me anyway. But some people were saying, well, there's a chance it might work, so why didn't you try and keep your job? The answer is because, as I've often preached, and I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't practice what I preached, if it ain't right, don't do it. And if it ain't true, don't say it. It's that simple. So, uh, I hope you've enjoyed that. Hospital, Port of Pride and Dignity, stop the new world order!